Ciao and welcome to Geo's Paintbrush, where five minutes is all it takes to be blown away by one of the world's greatest artists. Michelangelo Marisi da Caravaggio hailed from Caravaggio, Italy, a small town in Lombardy, about 25 miles east of Milan. While it was common for Italian surnames to be rooted in the geography of one's birth, consider, if you will, Leonardo da Vinci, whose last name means literally from Vinci, a town in Tuscany. No small town or even the big cities of Rome or Naples, for that matter, could possibly contain Caravaggio's supersized personality, violent demons, and powerful artistic vision. In Rome, Caravaggio ran with a rough street crowd, ultimately being arrested several times, fleeing the city with an outstanding warrant for his arrest for murder, following a duel in 1606, in which he ran his sword clear through the groin of his opponent. As far as historians can tell, the dispute was over a prostitute, or an affair Caravaggio may have had with a married woman, or an unpaid debt, or perhaps even a disputed point in a tennis match. Maybe it was nothing or all with Caravaggio. If he was going to create the most in-your-face, in-your-space, here's life writ large, like it or not paintings, maybe he had to actually live that way first, so that he could at once paint for the Pope and spend his nights with gamblers, prostitutes, the homeless, and petty thieves. His use of street people as models for saints, including a prostitute as a model for the Virgin Mary, the guy had a sense of irony, and of the essential truth of Christianity too, that is the lowest being the highest. His pioneering of dramatic lighting as a means of increasing exponentially the intensity of life. His characteristic manipulation of color and perspective illuminated earth tones in the immediate foreground against a deep black background, not a realistic background, but powerful in effect, and his approach, sans preliminary sketches and models. This all changed painting forever, bringing the viewer into the scene itself and influencing artists for generations to come in both method and purpose. Caravaggio was like a 60s rock star whose excesses led to both one-of-a-kind lasting art and a short life. Painting in the early 16th and 17th centuries, Caravaggio may have been Baroque, a movement dominated by action, self-confidence, and emotional rather than naturalistic truth. But his paintings, 400 years later, maintained their beauty, their richness, their power, seeming as fresh and interesting in the 21st century as they did in the 17th. In today's show, we'll explore Caravaggio's David Victorious over Goliath, Oil on Canvas, circa 1600, part of the permanent collection of the Museo del Prado in Madrid. Thanks for joining us. This painting, the earliest and first of Caravaggio's three works on the subject of the biblical David's victory over the Philistine giant Goliath, is the only one in which the artist portrays himself exclusively as the young hero of the Israelites, David. In his last work on the subject, about a decade after this one, Caravaggio, on the run in southern Italy and hoping for a papal pardon for a murder he committed around 1606, offers his own likeness in the face of the head of Goliath, held up by David like the head of a monster, almost as if Caravaggio was admitting guilt, coming to terms with his own dark side and perhaps the dark side in us all, and seeking mercy from Cardinal Borghese, who had the authority to grant the papal pardon. It's astonishing that the artist could paint like this while on the lamp. But here, around the turn of the century, in this painting, circa 1600, Caravaggio was working in Rome, earning a nice living from the Catholic Church for his religiously themed and especially inspirational art, and he's feeling a bit more David than Goliath. But setting aside the original and powerful drama Caravaggio creates through Curioscuro, the technique of theatrical lighting on a rich black backdrop. The remarkable thing about this take on the story of David's defeat of Goliath, the classic underdog story, and certainly one in harmony with the larger message of Christianity, the meek shall inherit the earth, is how solitary David is in his work here, following such a great battle, and how relaxed, calm, perhaps even businesslike this David seems. In this painting, there is no gloating. No adrenaline rush, not even a sense of relief. 
It's almost as if David fully expected his stone to hit the mark. See Goliath's bloody forehead. As if the outcome was entirely predictable, suggesting a level of self-confidence, and not incidentally a depth of faith, that must have been interpreted by church officials as reflected of the power of faith in God. And as David goes about the work of separating the head of Goliath, an allegorical symbol, for all its ugly, monstrous, evil, and human nature, the lithe young boy, clothed in a simple white robe and representing perhaps all that is pure and good within man, completes his victory, God's victory ultimately, the victory of what Lincoln called the better angels of our nature, over all that self-indulgence, self-absorption, obsession with worldly power, with brute force, with our basest instincts. The contrast Caravaggio offers in this painting is fascinating. On the one hand, Goliath's soon-to-be severed head is portrayed with technicolor realism, with clenched fist, bloodstains, splotchy, wrinkled skin, missing teeth, unkempt beard, and a startled, shocked death gaze, freezing in time the moment of his demise. David, on the other hand, is youthful, aglow, with an idealized complexion, clean-shaven, in motion, alive, yet without emotion, almost as if Donatello's young David in bronze bent over from its erect pose and went to work on Goliath's head. I find it interesting that Caravaggio chose to create each character with a clenched fist, one larger but forever frozen in death, clenched in an intense moment of surprise and pain, and the other, David's, obviously smaller, temporarily clenched in action, simply one movement and making a trophy of all that is evil within the world, maybe within humankind. As is always the case with Caravaggio, and perhaps this is his greatest contribution, he creates a foreground perspective that makes the viewer feel as if the action is unfolding in his or her space. The head of Goliath appears at our feet, and David's characteristically Baroque figure twists right in front of us, with his upper body and head almost seeming to lurch forward, off the canvas and into our world. I love how Caravaggio brings art into the world, rather than sets up barriers, artificial borders, that only serve to separate art from reality, when, in fact, art is a reality, is part of our world, and an important part at that. The historian and art aficionado Simon Schama, in his wonderful PBS series, The Power of Art, says of Caravaggio, For me, the power of Caravaggio's art is the power of truth, not the least about ourselves. If we are ever to hope for redemption, we have to begin with the recognition that in all of us, the Goliath competes with the David. And so that's the way it was with Caravaggio himself. Sometimes he was David, sometimes he was Goliath, and sometimes he was both. There never was an artist like Caravaggio before he emerged from obscurity in the late 15th century, and there has never been such an artist since. He lived the rare and intense life of a passionate, fervent rebel, a genius, always just a little out of control, but working for and within the most established authority of his time. Looking back, I suppose it was destined to end badly for Caravaggio, at least when it came to life on this earth. That's the price rebels pay, especially rebels who want it both ways. The most recent scholarship, as recent as June of 2010, suggests that Caravaggio died in 1610 at the age of 31, probably from lead poisoning from his own paints, combined with sunstroke from a life on the run, and wounds suffered in yet another scrape, this one probably down in Sicily, or perhaps from narrowly escaping an attempt on his life made in Naples, always a tough town. In any event, Caravaggio never made it back to Rome to secure the papal pardon he believed awaited him. But Caravaggio, as troubled and restless as he was, did leave an artistic legacy, first recognized in the 20th century, that is likely to remain influential for at least another 400 years. He didn't bring his art into the world. He brought the world into his art. He may have lived an intense and brief life, full of the extremes of human nature and ending terribly, perhaps even tragically. But the intensity he captured in paint, that lives on. It may not be worth such a life, but with Caravaggio, I'm not sure he could have painted with such ferocity with such careful brutality, had he not lived the life he led. It may have been the price he paid for the art he left behind. And at any rate, the world is better off for having it, because in Caravaggio, 
If we look with an open and honest mind, we can also see ourselves. Grazie mille e ciao. Like I could when I was small And it's so picturesque Looking through the crystal bar